Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, and this time we're looking at a DDI3 here from Zaxxon. You can see his uh, uh, logo there. So I think Zaxxon's a Polish chap. Uh, yeah, I, the, that, that I would suggest specy.pl. Um, the interesting thing is, see, it says there www.8bitclone.com. That website doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a bit crazy having that printed on there when uh, it doesn't seem to exist. Um, so as you can see, you know, this is a really nice uh, PCB here, it's like a really thick board, it's nicely assembled. We've got a little module on the bottom here, uh, and this has got a RAM on there, 512k this board supports, you know, provides. So it's an upgrade for the CPC as well, because I was struggling to find one of those um, DK Tronics, or whatever they are, um, 64k RAM expansions, you know, to take your 464 up to 128k. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll try and kill two birds with one stone. Now, it's Novabug I've got to thank for pointing me towards this product, actually. Uh, I mentioned uh, Novabug when I did that uh, 464 restore there, when I restored my 464 uh, at Play Expo uh, three or four years ago. Uh, he mentioned, um, you know, this board, the DDI3 here, and uh, he's covered uh, this in depth on his channel. He did a review there. It's a really good video. I'll post a link in the description to that video as well. You should go away and watch that, uh, despite the fact I'm kind of reviewing it here myself, but in a slightly different way I guess. And it, He's got the benefit of being able to show you the, um, I may do later, but he's got the benefit of being able to show you the uh, software that you can run, uh, I think it's, what you do is you stick an auto boot file on the card here, uh, and it provides like a little navigation system, a file manager, so that you can select the ROMs on there and assign them to up to I think 15 or 16, I think 16 virtual slots. So the idea being that when you power the thing on, you know, use the buttons here to go, uh, you know, previous, next, select, and on here it'll show you which slot you've got selected and the game that allocates that slot. Uh, so using that file manager there, it's quite a nice easy way of being able to, let's say, preload a bunch of games really easily. The alternative is you can just use the previous and next to navigate the entire file structure there to find the exact file you want, but that can be quite a bit fiddly. Uh, and now that's the situation I'm faced with at the moment with this particular unit. It's got uh, the latest firmware. Now this is where things get a bit confusing at the moment, uh, and I don't want to spin too much of a or put too much of a negative spin on this because I think it's a fantastic product. It's, you know the assembly is really good, the design is really nice, um, but I've got a few teething issues with this. Like I say, I've got the latest firmware, and the benefit of the firmware that's on here is it now works with .dsk files. You know, you've got things like the GoTech that work a similar way. You know, you've got a screen just like this one actually. It's probably based on the same uh, chips and things. Um, and you, you know, you stick your USB uh, pen drive in there, USB stick or whatever thumb stick. Um, and you know, you use the previous Next, etc., to select uh, you know a file. But with these uh, and the GoTech, you know, typically you had to convert using a utility convert all your you know dot dsk files your uh, or, or other systems you know like your i don't know st dot st files convert them to a dot hfe so that was a bit of a pain actually because you know you had to go through all your collection convert them all to dot hfe files stick them all on here then use the file manager to select which ones you wanted and that conversion process was a pain but now the nice thing is like i said this version of the version of firmware on here just loads dot dsk files and that's the native file format you'll find for disk images for the uh, CPC, so that's really sweet. So just like Novabug said in his video, uh, I had some teething issues setting all this up because there's very little in the way of documentation, in fact there's none really. There are a few reviews out there uh, that talk about some of the things to set it all up and stuff, but I ran into issues because those uh, relate to the older firmware, you know, so one of the things it talks you through there is, you know, uh, there's some zips there, you can now load the, uh, you know, the file manager, unzip your auto boot.hfe, I think it is, is it, and stick that in the root of your, you know, your card here, and of course that worked, and I was able to eventually get it to boot that file, but then I, I got an error, it comes up with an error when it's initialising, it says it can't, uh, it's a problem reading the USB or something. It's uh, and I tried various USB sticks. It's got nothing to do with that at all. And I did a bit of research and found one or two of the people saying the same things with the latest version of the firmware. Now the interesting thing there, they said they rolled back. I'm not sure how to roll back. I don't know how to whether I could safely roll this back to a prior version. There's no documentation. I don't know how you update it. Um, now I did contact Zaxxon and initially he was quite supportive. You know he did say you know all you've got to do is. Uh, uh, stick your files, you know, stick your .dsk files in the root of the card and just use the buttons. And that's great, that works actually, you can do that. But there's just one minor issue with that, 
uh, and I'll perhaps show you uh, in a minute as uh, I demonstrate this uh, and it's the refresh speed of the screen you know you've got quite a long file name so as you go through a list of files in a folder uh, it goes so fast you can't read it it's just totally unreadable and the only way you can stop that is to then select that file it stops and then you can read it so you've got to go select stop you've got to you know, like next select next select next select to go up through the list to see what it is you're actually looking at uh, so that's really really fiddly now normally you can use a little utility that um, allows you to edit the cfg the configuration file that you stick on here you know there's one file that's just the root this uh, i can't remember really what it's called H hxc cfg dot cfg or something i think it is and that file can be edited like say using a special exe on windows or on the mac um, and one of the properties you can set is the sp speed of the refresh there the scrolling the scroll speed it doesn't make any difference on this model so i'm guessing it's again because the firmware version on this uh, now there was an interesting post on one of uh, zaxon's videos actually showing the ddi3 say and it was from jeff at uh, you know jeff uh, 2001 you know the hf uh, hxc firmware guy the guy who's done all the software for this for the different systems and he's done the firmware for the GoTech and various other things uh, and he posted an update to say that the latest version for cpc now to loads dsk files and i thought oh great so maybe he knows something about this so i've asked him the question as well as what do i need to do because i can't get an auto boot you know file manager running with this particular firmware um, but he's not got back to me either um, and Zaxxon's not got back to me in the last week actually um, despite you know having asked is there a version of auto boot you know that I can actually run with this that will allow me to you know boot some code on the CPC there to select you know to fill those virtual slots so it would seem at this particular point in time um, there's a, an issue there with the firmware a mismatch between the firmware and some of the, the file manager that's available on the internet but I wouldn't let that put you off. I think in general, like I say, I think it's a fantastic product and there may be, hopefully, part two to this video at some point once I get a file manager working, once Zaxxon's had time to have a look, because he's very busy. Uh, and the same with Jeff, maybe Jeff will get back to me at some point. Um, so yeah, it's got 512K on the back there, um, as I mentioned earlier, so that's really sweet. So I don't need to worry about trying to find a memory upgrade for my system. Um, it would have been nice if that was more modular, you know, I guess, you know, you could have done, you could have had a, a pass through on this side and then another one of these here to join it on the back, that would have been sweet and then you could have the two separated, but I'm not that fussed really, uh, I'm probably only going to use this, um, you know, now, I'm not going to be using tapes and things again. Uh, now the cool thing straight away is, and I spotted this instantly actually, as soon as I got it out of the box, you'll see there we've got an NEC D765AC, the 765 was familiar to me. That's a floppy disk controller, uh, and I know that because I used to service an awful lot of Amstrad PCWs, uh, as well as some of the old 8, uh, 8088 um, or 8086, you know, the old eight, uh, PCs, XT PCs, etc. Before you got into the 80, you know, 286s and things. And a lot of those had these uh, 765 floppy disk controllers, actually, uh, certainly the very old PCs, um, because there is a limit there, I think, in what that'll, that this particular chip. Uh, the type, the geometry of the disc, you know, the number of, oh, I think it'll do double sided, but it's like, you know, a certain capacity. So, like I say, that, that's the reason that caught my eye. So, um, normally with a CPC, if you want to use a disc drive, you've got to have the DDI 1, you know, and that's an official, I uh, think, an Amstrad product that's got one of these on there, 765. So, it's interesting the approach taken here to actually replicate with an actual. 765 you know i would have sort of imagining there would be an fpga to replicate that but uh, you know no there isn't it's actually uh, you know back to basics we're actually replicating the original thing so uh, that's quite nice in some ways and there's an additional benefit well i mean you can do the same thing with fpga but there is a benefit to having the actual floppy controller on here um, and that is you could have you know your, your idc connected there and connect a physical drive up because you've got you know the capability here uh, so that's the, the nice thing with this, and there's a switch up here, I think, I forget which one it is, I think it's the one on the left, might be, to switch between the internal drive and the external drive. So you can have, like say, I could get an IDC cable, get a three and a half inch floppy drive, as long as I can power that, I've got the right, I might need a twist in the cable and a couple of the connections, I'm not sure, I might need to mess with the jumpers on the drive, but in theory, I could use you know, a physical drive with this, so that's really, really nice, actually. So, you know, there's another reason to want one of these, even if you, you know, you've got an actual disk drive, you've not got a DDA-1, uh, this is a good replacement for that, I would suggest. Um, and then you've got the added benefit of being able to use this as well. And if you do what I did, you know, and go for the 512K, uh, upgrade as well you've got the best of both worlds really 
Um, so you've got a reset button on the side there as well. That's pretty sweet. Uh, and then the other switch up here is, you'll notice down here we've got a large chip, um, and that's uh, a ROM. I think it's an AT27C512R, uh, actually. That's the same chip I've been using for PLA replacements, actually. Assuming it's a you know, genuine one. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to criticise this in any way. It's like I said, there's a lot of these around that are fake, these are Atmel uh, ones. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, that's got a, a ROM on it, and it's got I think it's got Parados. Um, so you can switch over. I think this is the right-hand switch here. You can switch over between you know the built-in ROM and the CPC or Parados. Uh, now I'm not that hot on the differences between some of these things. I'm quite new to the CPC. I'm a, a CPC newbie kind of thing. So you know you've got questions about things like that. Your best uh, ports of call is to speak to Novabug um, or Smooth MJ because I know Smooth MJ's pretty uh, clued up on the CPC side of things. And then obviously, you know, and finally, you know, your USB uh, memory stick goes in here. Uh, now I think this is an eight gig. Yeah, it's an eight gig card there. So and it seems to support that fine. So you know, that's it's not got the same sort of restrictions that some of these other products have. You know, I think like this for example, and I could be wrong, but my memory. Um, something in my mind is telling me that there was a limit of somewhat like two gig partitions or something on this it might be four gig i don't know on the compact flash uh divide e here for the spectrum so you know there's a limitation there but i don't think there is on this i think you could perhaps go up to you know 32 gig or 64 gig i suspect that would probably be okay because i mean it's quite happy with eight gig so i thought i'd show you the software here that you can use with this now there's a windows version and a mac version now, Novabug's demonstrated some of this stuff before i think but you know this is what you can use to configure the card it produces a CFG file on the, the actual uh, SD card. So, for example, you go into um, there's two there. There's SD HXC floppy emulator settings, and there's USB HXC emulator flopping. So, this is the USB version on the DDI3, and if you click that, um, you have these options here at the top. So, none of those are relevant to you know the screen refresh rate or anything. The other thing you've got is where's it gone now? Yeah, on the on the normal SD version settings here and this is why I'm not sure there's compatibility you can see you've got scroll text speed now on the same um, HXC floppy emulator in the ST there um, that works you know if you set that save the config file here it's you know there's the file it creates and you can just about see that off screen there HXC SD uh, FE .cfg. You stick that in the root of your SD card and whatever settings you've set in here to do with the scrolling, the, uh, some of them do sound, this one doesn't on the DDI3. Normally that will affect the scroll speed, it doesn't. So you know the only way I can read the text of long file names there is to press the select button. You know, I can, or as you saw in the video there, you can, if you hold down like the next button when the, it's on the first character of the, you know, the, the, the file limit showing it then starts to scroll up through the files and you can see see it relatively easy but if you part way through it scrolling on that first the file before you've pressed the next button you then start to see garbage and that's the problem it makes it very hard to you know to, to find the uh, the ROM that way the file manager is much better I'll just see if I could just show you a clip of the file manager and of course the other thing you can do with this is as you see here you can load a floppy image, so you select load, and it says you know you go away, you find your .dsk file or whatever, and it, you can it then export it. You can choose export there, export the, the saved file, uh, and it produces a .hfe file. And that was the way the old fir firmware worked. You had to convert all your .dsk .dis uh, DS files, your disk images, all to .hfes, and that was a bit of a pain. Now I had to do that with my Atari ST. I'll stick the Atari ST up here so just so you can have a see, but yeah, the HXC um, floppy drive emulator I've got in there, that is one of the problems with the version of firmware I have on there, where all of the .st files have to be converted to .hfe, it's, you know, it's a time consuming, annoying process. So it's great that this particular version that um, Zaxxon's produced uses uh, native uh, you know, .dsk files, that's really cool. Um, but it'd be really cool if the interface worked, I'll show you that in a sec. Quick clip from Zaxxon's video, I'll stick a link down below. You can see here with the auto boot file manager um, in the previous version of firmware that you know it supported this. I think Novabook uses this as well. And as you can see, it allows you to navigate the SD card there on the CPC. Um, you know, so you can select the games and assign them to like say one of 15 or 16 virtual slots. So I think without further ado, we'll plug this into the back of the CPC there uh, and I'll show you it working. Uh, I will just talk briefly about one, one mod before we go and show it as well I'm going to do to this. I've ordered some uh, plastic support pillars here 
and I'm going to what I'm going to do is replace. Uh, let me show you, replace all four of them actually, um, and I'm going to slope a couple of them so that the screen sits like that at an angle. The reason being, when it's on the CPC and it's on a table sort of level like that, you can't see the screen. So what I'm going to do is tilt it so the screen is like that, and there's room to do that. Nothing will show. You know, if, if I put quite a short post here uh, and a short post down here. Um, and tilt the front bit, you know, down so it's a, I don't know, a centimetre away from the board. It'll be clear here without any problems at all. Uh, and then I'll just put similar size posts uh, of the ones that are there now, these metal ones, but I'll, sh you know, uh, shave the, them down so that we're at an angle so that it fits flush with the board. So, like I said, the idea is that the screen will be, uh, you know, sort of like at the angle, despite the thing being upright like that. Uh, and then the other thing I'm going to do as well is uh, just I'll mount a little connector or something so I can detach it. But on these buttons here, the pre uh, previous uh, next and select, just join some wires up to a little PCB with a, you know that sits off at a distance, so that a dist from a distance I can just press the buttons to navigate without putting any pressure on this. And it's the same problem with this and a lot of these things that and and you know this is me just being a bit finicky I guess. You know, when you're pressing the buttons, it, the, you wobble in it like that you know and okay you've got a fairly good reliable connection here but you're asking for trouble you know if you're doing it a lot you know if you're wobbling the thing like that a lot uh, so you know that's one thing I would hope that some of these uh, manufacturers of these would consider uh, as a future revision at some point to add some something in just like a little JST thing where you can just plug a cable in and have a little wire coming off with a little PCB maybe isolate the underneath so you've not got the SD potential onto the buttons and things but that uh, <clears throat> might be something you might want to think about doing but like I say it's me just being a little bit cautious because uh, I do know on the spectrum for example if you were to inadvertently disconnect this and plug this in while it's on you'll destroy the ULA it's, it's that easy to damage things so it kind of stands to reason if you've got a dirty connection there you know and you've had a lot of use and you keep pressing the thing pressing the thing pressing the thing you know at some point you could have a bad connection there and something could die um, but you could just get a loose you could just get a loose slot just from, you know, like say, tens of thousands of times you press the buttons. I mean, by that time your buttons will have worn out, probably, but you see what I'm trying to say, you know, I just don't like, uh, in general, these kind of mods where you're pressing buttons and things are wobbling around. Uh, I do appreciate there's no easy way to do it, but a cable coming off would solve that. So I thought we'd go old school here. Uh, I'm not sure how well the CRT is going to capture uh, here. We might get some bands and things scrolling across, but hopefully, yeah, it's not too bad. I think I just saw a band come up there. Um, I'll connect this up now to the back, uh, you know, and it just plugs, I'll show you, uh, it just plugs into the expansion port uh, down there, it says, I think it says disk drive on it actually. So we're in Paradox there, I'm just going to switch it off, and I'm going to switch the uh, ROM back over actually, I think it's, is it the right hand one? Yeah it is. Now I think if we just do CAT, press return, should give us a catalogue of the disk, you know, list of the directory there. And as you can see we've got uh, targets, so if we just do run uh, target. Yeah, that should load. So this is, like I say, we're replicating the original disk drive here and the DDI1 all via that um, nice board there. And we've got the additional RAM as well. So, yeah, I might need to just play with the settings in the back of the monitor here because it's not very centered and stuff, is it? I'll just see if I can improve that. Yeah, so our picture's a bit better there. So yeah, sweet. Um, and when we can test out that memory in a minute, the additional RAM, because if we load Robocop, we should get samples when we've got 128K. Uh, and it's the same thing with Chase HQ. If we're not thinking back to what Novabug said in his video there, uh, Chase HQ should have some samples and things when we load that as well. So that's a good way to test if we've got that additional RAM. Now what I can't do is test anything beyond 128k um, because I'm not sure what demos or things out there may make use of more than 128k. Just make sure that works. I mean you've seen this before but yeah the main thing is to make sure it's working it is, as you can see. So uh, we'll load a bit of Robocop now, let's just see if the samples are working. Yeah so I don't know whether you can see the screen at all, you know it's saying 026 of 526. You know, so this is the problem, 526 games in there, I could be there forever pressing the next button. You can hold it down and it zooms a little bit faster that way. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go back to zero. So it's, it's wobbling all the way, I don't like the wobbling thing. Um, the folder there is dot dot. So if I now do select, we'll go back a folder. And then we're into the, you know, A to Z directory structure here. 
so I can go and find I forgot what loaded now. Chase HQ. Well, let's do Robocop first. So we've got our select. Yeah, and I'm guessing Robocop's going to be further in. So that what I've been doing is just zooming up like that. We're on file 45, hit select, see where we are. We're on RAM, RAM base. So we're nowhere near RO because they are in alphabetical order. So I just keep going all the way up. Sometimes you can see it scrolling. I can see the first few letters scrolling there. We're up to RE. Uh, Renegade, uh, Return something, Rick Dangerous I just saw, RI, RO, here we are, getting nearly there, now select, Road Toad, so this is the thing, you know, it's, it's painful to use this way, it really is, it's going to take me a minute or two now to find Robocop, we're, we're near, we're getting near I think, Robin Hood. So we we'll select that. Yeah, it's still loading. There you go. So hopefully you heard that. And I can turn it up a little bit here and we can hear the speech when I start the game. Let's just do keyboard. Oh it's a joystick, let's do that. Excellent. So yeah, sweet. That's really good. So I think the benefit is we can load homebrew. Uh, I think this is the one uh, I saw on Novabook's channel and this looks absolutely great actually. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've got the screen set right there. I might be chopping off the top of the screen a little bit but yeah, this is uh, a really sweet piece of homebrew actually. Very challenging but uh, fun nonetheless. It's got some great music as well actually. And Outlaws as well, which is another sweet piece of uh, homebrew that I first saw on Novabook's channel. I really need to do something with a geometry on this. Huh? You can see we've got like a little bit, bit, bit of a bend there on this side on this uh, monitor. You don't notice it so much in other, get on other systems, you know, because the picture's further out, you know, it comes right to the edge. but. I mean, I could widen it with the settings on the back, so let's just do uh, two joystick, three play. Oh so, yeah, sweet, this is the train, I think this is what you've got to do before you go into the game. Kind of reminds me of Cabal, uh, the way this is uh, being set up. Yeah, playing really badly, but fantastic, nevertheless. Another game I've been wanting to play on here as well, since we got the CBC, is the remake of R-Type because that looks pretty good as well actually, so we'll just give that a quick uh, go. So this is the R-Type remake. Well, it's interesting, that's jumping up and down a bit, that's freaking me out. It's like an interlaced image I think they're there. Sweet, that stereo music is awesome. The intro is just so good on this actually, they've made really good use of graphics mode there and the colours and things, it's fantastic. Yeah, I've not got the settings right on this, so it's like I've got it that's coming right off the back. Uh, got it right off the top and bottom there, that's where it should be. It's because I've been expanding it for the uh, the games that have used, uh, uh, I don't know what mode it was in, but the other games where it was scrunched up into the middle there, I think it expanded it out a bit, but that's more representative of what it should be. So, let's uh, hit fire. So, let's start. I mean, nice attention to detail on the tile screen and the sound effects and things. It's you know it's very 
similar to the arcade already, you know, I'm much more impressed with this version than the standard one. And there's a lot more speed, it's a lot smoother I think on the uh, on this version as well. Yeah, but look how fast you can move, that's crazy, compared to the original version. So yeah, a really cool remake actually, this. You know, and that's the thing, it's like if you just got a normal uh, disk drive, how would you get this onto the disk drive? You'd have to somehow transfer it to the CPC in order to write that disk drive, unless you, you know, you wrote the disk on a PC or something, an old uh, PC, because, you know, people do that, I've done that with the Atari ST, I actually created Atari ST discs using an old PC, floppy disk on an old PC. Um, so, yeah, the DDI3 is really good for running all this homebrew stuff as well as, you know, your full game collection there. So that was just a short look at the DDI3, you know, not really a comprehensive review. So do check out Novabug's channel, um, he's done a number of uh, fantastic videos on his channel actually. Usually when he goes to the expos he's always interviewing someone interesting, I think he interviewed the uh, the, the, the guys there behind uh, Dizzy, um, uh, the twins, I can't remember the name now, um, but anyway yeah he's interviewed various people, uh, he does lots of game plays and you know short, uh, I like some of the short videos he does just like 5 minutes or 10 minutes gameplay of a particular game. Um, covers all sorts of different systems as well, not just the CPC, it does a lot of, uh, you know, arcade stuff and PlayStation things and stuff, you know, his high score challenges. Um, so it's well worth checking his channel out. A quick update here, you can see I had to go at, uh, you know, changing the angle of the display there. You're limited because, obviously, you know, the whole spacings are a certain distance apart. So you can only go within a certain range there. What I could do is just not, you know, either widen the holes here, you know, turn them into almost slots, or chop off the post, actually. Um, you know, slant, you know, angle it, like I said I was going to do. Uh, turn this post the other way up so that the, uh, screw, you know, the nut is on this side and the screw goes through there, and angle you know, uh, chamfer or whatever, you know, the, the edges there to give more of a slope, you know, so it, you could get more of an angle there, but as you can see, you know, it's kind of pointing upwards a bit, it's certainly better than it was, um, but you know, I could go further with that. One thing I would point out is modern USB pen uh, devices like this, this is a, a cruiser, as you can see, cruiser uh, blade, 8 gig, what a piece of junk this is, it's just totally plastic, all of the connectors all around here is plastic, it's like the flimsiest sort of thing you can imagine, in a year or two that's not going to work, it's going to break, it's like, it's that kind of like biodegradable type plastic, you know, probably, uh, you know, environmental friendly sort of thing, um, you know, they're really cheap, uh, they've got cheap and nasty, even good make like SanDisk, and the other thing is, they get super hot, that's the incredible thing, you know, you plug this in into a USB port, um, and after a few seconds, just prep touch it, it's like 60 degrees or something, it's crazy, I'm guessing it's because they've got some sort of step down, you know, um, you know, maybe some sort of linear regulator in there from 5 volts down to 3.3 or something. It's crazy how much how hot those get, actually. So you can buy these from uh, Sell My Retro. Uh, again, I'll post some links below. Uh, I think this was about £80, I think, uh, maybe 75-ish, £75. On uh, obviously some shipping. But you can get the cheaper version without the 512k. Uh, on it, you know, I think it's about 20 quid less, I think it's about 55 pounds or something if you buy just a straight DDI3, so I mean that is absolute value for money in my mind, um, and I still, I think it's even more value for money with the memory, personally, because those um, uh, memory expansions, you know, the official DKtronics ones on eBay, 100 pounds upwards, I think there was one on the other week that Novabug pointed me towards, and it was 170 pounds or something, something similar to that, it's crazy. But uh, anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.